Thank you, and welcome back. Uh, thanks for showing. Um, last winter, uh, a mass of uh, unseasonably warm water developed off our coast. Uh, the anomalies there in SST um, greater than two and a half degrees C. That actually has gotten quite a bit of attention of in the media. In fact, they made a movie of it. Um, I've been calling it the blob, and uh, that was actually picked up, and uh, I think it is describable, and that's what I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about here today. And in particular, uh, some work that the State Climate Office has done in collaboration with Megan Cronin um, of the Ocean Climate Stations Group and NOAA PML. I'm going to talk a little bit about the formation of the blob, this, um, this mass of warm water off our coast. And uh, to this crowd, what I think is going to be um, perhaps um, especially interesting is the relationship of those masses of warm water off our coast to our regional weather. So um, there's uh, something about high pressure in the title. I figured I had to show a sea level pressure anomaly slide. And, uh, one thing I want to emphasize here is how extreme of a climate forcing, short term climate forcing event this was. The four month average SLP anomalies off our coast approached 10 millibars, which is, um, at least in this region, was kind of unprecedented for that uh, winter season. And so that, um, that constituted very anomalous atmosphere, atmospheric forcing of the ocean there and contributed to our very dry and settled period of weather in the middle of last winter. Uh, in the analysis that I'm going to be showing, there is uh, kind of three different kind of sources um, that I use for that. Um, the first part here is going to be on the actual, the mechanisms behind the, um, the blob, how, how it developed. And there I'm going to uh, be using the GODAS um, ocean uh, data assimilation system. It's actually kind of like an ocean reanalysis, kind of like an atmospheric reanalysis, in which is an ocean model that's ingesting all the available observations to hopefully kind of keep it on track. And so um, that's the what I'm going to do first. And then in looking at how our weather relates to the, um, the conditions offshore. Uh, looking at some um, an atmospheric reanalysis, uh, specifically the NSEP reanalysis for that, and then going to touch on a little bit on the predictions from the CFS model for this summer and how they did. Okay, so with it, with regards to the formation of the blob, I'd like for you to first direct your attention to the red trace there, that is the. Um, uh, for, the, uh, for this large area, 40 to 50 north, 150 to 135 west, the months of October through January, I, I forget whether I took it into February or not. Um, what the, uh, the red trace there is the mean wind speed cubed. That is a measure of the, amount, the power of the, uh, the atmosphere uh, that's putting, um, creating turbulence in the ocean that is stirring up cold water from below the mixed layer up into near surface waters. And that's um, uh, just a measure of the, of the again, the um, energy available for uh, wind-induced mixing. The blue trace there is the wind stress curl, another thing oceanographers look at all the time. Positive uh, values there. Um, and it's usually positive, but not always over that region, uh, implied that cyclonic vorticity is being put into the ocean. Negative values uh, imply that it's um, uh, anti-cyclonic vorticity being gone into the ocean. And the main message I want to make here is that the wind speed cubed was the least in that record of 30 plus years. Uh, from the point of view of the wind stress curl, it was unusual in that it was slightly negative, but there was some precedent for that. In terms of the oceanic response, a couple of traces here. The, uh, again, the blue one, the first one I want you to look at is a time series, again, over the kind of middle of winter here, of how much deepening of the mixed layer there is from October to February. Normally, it's about 65 meters. It goes from something like 30 meters deep at the 
uh, in fall into um, over 100 meters or so deep. And right there at uh, the last winter, it was unprecedented, unprecedented little amount of deepening, something like 55 meters of deepening rather than the usual 60 something. Um, the red trace there is just a measure of the kind of the, the strength of the density interface there at the base of the mixed layer. And that was also unprecedented. And that's a measure of how warm the water is and less dense this mixed layer is on top of uh, uh, the um, waters at depth. So uh, this slide I want to spend a little bit of time on. And this is uh, just the last about the kind of the mechanisms behind the blob. And just showing uh, here uh, the results from um, a mixed layer heat budget, again, for this big area. 50 by 40, uh, 15 degrees longitude across for the winter as a whole. And I direct your attention to the lower trace there that shows the average amount of, or the cooling from October to February for that mixed layer. It's typically something like seven and a half degrees Celsius over that, that winter period. And again, our last year, a record little cooling of something like five and a half degrees. What goes into that is um, the three main terms in that heat budget is uh, how much, what the currents are doing. Typically, there's a little bit of cold advection that is kind of tending to cool that, um, that box of water. And uh, last winter, it was virtually nil. Again, kind of a record. I'm going to kind of keep repeating myself. The net surface heat fluxes, the combination of the uh, uh, radiative fluxes, sensible and latent heat fluxes at the surface, also right about at a record. The, um, the last term there is how much of this, uh, the cooling rate due to the cooled water that's kind of mixed up from below, that actually turned out not to be so unusual. And there it was a case the entrainment rate was actually low but because the water was so warm above, every uh, kilogram of water you moved up in there was that much more effective at cooling. And so when you actually convert it into a, um, how much temperature drop it caused, the entrainment was not especially um, unusual. But the screaming message was um, we haven't seen that out there uh, at least since 1980. Okay. But uh, what I want to focus on here is now, you know, who cares? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe you're not a tuna or a tuna fisherman or something like that. And what, what I want to focus on here is, let's see if this, is what the SSTs are in this, whoops, uh, in that box there versus what the, atmospheric boundary layer properties are, thermodynamic properties are over the kind of west of the Cascades of the Oregon um, and Washington State. And so what I have done is just uh, done an average here in the summer to late summer months of July through September, the blue trace is the SSTs. And here I'm using the um, INSEP reanalysis that goes back to the late 40s. And so you can see it chatters back and forth uh, year to year. Um, I think Cliff mentioned we don't really see a trend in SST for that region. Okay. Um, and, uh, but the, the peaks and the uh, big uh, negative anomalies in that SST do correspond with uh, peaks and uh, valleys in the red trace there, which is a measure of the thermodynamic properties of the boundary layer over land. And in particular, here I chose the moist static energy. That takes into account both the humidity content and the temperature of the, of the boundary layer. And uh, that blue star there, uh, our SSTs are kind of in the uncharted territory. I, of course, don't know what it's going to be for September here exactly. Maybe a better way to look at this relationship is a scatter plot over those same years. And again, there's a positive relationship between the SST offshore and our, um, what our atmosphere is like over us. 
um, as you may recall, this summer so far has been on the warm side. It's actually been on the humid side too. You know, some of the nighttime temperatures have been running above normal. What I'm anticipating is, uh, I'm sure, pretty sure that SSTs are gonna be off the chart there at something like 16.3, 16.5 for the, um, for the uh, July through September. I don't know what those moist static energies are gonna be like, but since we've already kind of had some warm and moist uh, temperatures, um, I'm pretty sure they're gonna be well above normal. And uh, the correlation coefficient between those is about um, 0 0.5, 25% of the variance or so. Maybe you're not impressed, but in the climate, seasonal climate game, that's pretty good shooting, actually. If uh, you look at just um, the correlations between the SST and the uh, temperature and the humidity individually, the correlation coefficients are something like 0 0.4. And so there's some sort of compensation there, and that kind of makes sense. Um, won't get too much into that. All right. Uh, back to... You know, okay, these uh, SSTs anomalies persisted into the summer that I'm arguing were um, largely not wholly created by the weird weather we had last winter. Could we have anticipated that? Um, uh, if, you, if that slide looks fuzzy, you should see your optometrist is actually crisp as can be, um, uh, anyway, sorry, I just want to pull off the web. Uh, but this is a forecast made in April uh, from the workhouse, um, workhorse uh, climate model from uh, NCEP CPC of what the sea surface temperature anomalies would be for the uh, June through August period. And uh, again, you know, they, they have been warm off our coast. Here's a case where the model might have gotten close to the right answer, um, answer for maybe the wrong reason in that it obviously had the El Nino kind of firing up a little uh, stronger or earlier than it, it's proving to be. In terms of just air temperature anomalies, it forecasts again from April, and the forecasts from March were very similar also. Had a, uh, the western, west coast of the lower 48 warmer than normal, and sure enough, that's, that's what was observed. And what I want to emphasize is that we can't really attribute that to the anomalies in the circulation itself. And I'm arguing that um, a reason to look at the SST in summer is because those circulation anomalies in summer tend to be modest. In winter, we have big ridges and troughs and 10 millibars uh, sea level pressure anomalies. Here this past summer, they've been something like a half a millibar in the region at most. And, the great, over us, virtually nil. And so this does not look like a hot pattern. And I'd, uh, if Matt um, thinks differently, then we can settle it like men outside or something like that. But uh, uh, previous uh, uh, hot summers have tended to be um, with higher pressures um, in British Columbia, lower pressure than normal over us, and more offshore flow. And that just hasn't been the case this time. So. Just uh, my final remarks, uh, again, um, there was some very kind of screwy weather last winter. We can't attribute it to ENSO or the usual building blocks of the climate variability, but it, and so it's basically characterized as climate noise, but it was deafening. It was a big signal, and uh, that res uh, resulted in suppressed cooling of the upper ocean. It looks like our um, boundary layer properties relate to what the SST is like offshore, at least during the summer. And in fact, that our, uh, the CFS model did a reasonable prediction of that. And with that, I'll close. Thanks. Thanks. Um, any questions for, um, for Nick on this talk or issues around the uh, Guillaume. Yeah, well, it could be. And what were um, one thing I didn't really emphasize here in this um, in this trace here, the red trace, is that we're 
tending to have an upward trend in that. I'm seeing a little bit of an increase, at least last few years, which doesn't make a trend, of uh, kind of summer thunderstorms around here. There's been more than there have been in the distant historical past, and so it's intriguing. I, I can't say that that's definitely been established, though. Well, we have had more thunderstorms than usual, in, at least in western Washington. And if you're thinking that's, you know, the kind of heavy uh, precipitation events that could be associated with uh, this. Uh, our summer thunderstorms, a lot of times the moisture is aloft, so it gets kind of complicated, I think. Gordon. Both, yeah. And there, we have a really good idea of the SST there, and I, I think there's um, quite a bit of confidence in that. Uh, the stuff that I did with the ocean reanalysis, that's um, less constrained by real observations than the SST. There is um, other satellite altimetry and other things that go into that, but I, I'm quite confident it was warm out there at the surface. Um, exactly what was going on at depth is a little uh, especially back before the Argo days, um, it's hard to say. Thank you.